for solo by Hakeem Missouri, the music of Afghanistan. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Anjali Comet. And we're looking at Afghanistan past, present and future on this eve of President Obama's um, address to a joint session of Congress. He's expected to address the economy and Afghanistan. We're focusing on Afghanistan today as we're joined in Boston by Paul Gould and Elizabeth Fitzgerald, the first American journalist allowed to access to Afghanistan in 1981 following the Soviet invasion expulsion of the entire Western press. They did an exclusive news story for CBS Evening News and produced a documentary for PBS called Afghanistan Between Three Worlds. Now they're out with a book about U.S. involvement in Afghanistan. It's called Invisible History, Afghanistan's Untold Story. We welcome you both to Democracy Now!, Paul Fitzgerald and Elizabeth Gould. Why don't you start by telling us what you think is most misunderstood about Afghanistan? Liz? Well, I think the, um, the whole origin of Afghanistan's conflict really uh, rests in Washington. I think that is the most misunderstood issue. And when we focus on the results of what happened coming out of Washington that really affected the ability of Afghanistan to develop what really had been historically throughout a, a good part of the 20th century, a very moderate form of Islam, a government, uh, you know, that back in the 1920s was establishing women's rights in the form of giving women the right to vote. So you can see that in terms of these uh, effects on the, on the way in which a country is actually forming and its own evolution, and then, then suddenly uh, the impact of a policy that's determined in Washington beginning to affect what's going on in Afghanistan. And that really goes back, really, to the Eisenhower administration. So I'd say that, for me, is the most mis misunderstood element. And one of the things that we've noticed recently, uh, and, and is the most disturbing, is, is that we've been listening to this stuff for 30 years now, and we're, we're beginning to hear a lot of the same kind of misinformation and, quite frankly, disinformation from the same people who were putting that out in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, about Afghanistan and, uh, and its importance to the United States. And uh, it's, it's really uh, very frustrating to hear that coming from some people at this point who really should know better. On that note, I want to go to former National Security Advisor under President Kartner. So Big New Brzezinski was on MSNBC's Morning Joe last week discussing Afghanistan. If you go back to our initial engagement in Afghanistan, the objective has been to create a democratic, modern Afghanistan. That's our words for an objective that, for a decade earlier, the Soviets sought with slightly different words, a socialist, advanced Afghanistan. Both goals are unattainable, because the Afghans don't want foreigners with guns telling them how to suck eggs, how to organize themselves. Mm -hmm. I think we have to define our objective more narrowly. That is to say, we don't want Afghanistan but I get also to Pakistan this way, nor Pakistan, to be the basis for international terrorist activity directed particularly at us, but also at our friends. Now, is Taliban a terrorist organization, or is it an ugly, medieval-type mm -hmm. throwback of a purely local character? I tend to think that it is, that's what it is. Uh, the Taliban does terrible things. I was talking to someone about this last night at dinner, and this person said, yeah, but what about the horrible things they do to women and so forth? That's the painful part. But the same things happen in some other parts of the world. Are we going to go everywhere? Paul Fitzgerald, can you talk about what happened in 1979, just before the Soviet invasion, and Zbigniew Brzezinski's role in that? Well, one of the big problems that I have with what uh, Mr. Brzezinski said was the fact that he was the one who was very much instrumental in, in bringing back the anti-modernist element in Afghan society, which had come to terms pretty much with the Afghan government, with, with a 50, 60 years' worth of Afghan governments trying to slowly modernize their society after the, de the, the devastation of both Russian and, uh, and British colonialism in that part of the world. So, you know, to focus on that one area one of the things specifically that we looked at uh, in terms of the documents, the documentation, which is all now available in terms of what the Soviets were up to and in terms of what the United States was up to, 
The Soviets specifically tried to get a, a non-aligned, non-Marxist government. And they actually, before they invaded, tried to get the Marxists to step down and to hold elections and to, to establish a lawyer jurga that would actually bring in uh, a lot of the other, other elements. The, the KGB station in, in uh, Kabul was not happy about the Marxists taking over. They knew full well that they did not have broad support of the people, regardless of what their political outlook was. And the, and the Russians were telling them that. And the Russians were also telling the Carter administration exactly what their plans were and what they were going to do. In fact, uh, Secretary of Defense, who is now the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, states in his book, if ever there was something that the United States knew ahead of time was going to happen, it was the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan. Wasn't it uh, Brzezinski himself uh, who, when interviewed some 10 years ago by the French newspaper Le Nouvel Observateur, um, said as, of course, this is before 2001, the September 11th attacks, he said, what's most important to the history of the world, the Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet empire, some stirred up Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War, talking about the U.S. support for the Mujahideen, Paul Fitzgerald. That's exactly it. Um, as I said, you know, uh, one of the things about we've been hearing a lot of very strange talk about what goes on in Afghanistan, and that's what motivated us to go there in 1981. We were saying, well, we're getting the story from the Russian side of, uh, of the coin. We're getting the story from the American side of the coin. What is going on in Afghanistan? When we went there, what we saw was a country that was struggling to be independent, struggling to be democratic. And uh, the Soviet Union, for whatever their faults are, and we know they had plenty, what they were doing was they were supporting the progressive, the more progressive elements in Afghan society. The United States had been doing that in a certain period of time during their so-called experiment in democracy during the 1960s and the 1970s. But unfortunately, after 1973, uh, the United States turned its, its back on advancing the cause of Afghan democracy and started supporting the, uh, uh, the Taliban, not the Taliban, the uh, Mujahideen movement, which was being run by the ISI in Pakistan, the intelligence uh, at arm of the uh, Pakistani army. And, and this is where things began to go terribly wrong. And uh, as a result of that, we wound up in the 1980s with this kind of good versus evil uh, uh, mantra, which was almost a kind of Hollywoodized version of this very complex situation in which the Afghan government and the progressives in Afghanistan were trying to give women their rights. They were dealing with, and the men were doing this as well. It wasn't just women's organizations. The men were trying to do this as well. And they were up against some very, very conservative medieval fundamentalists who were over the border in Pakistan or up in the mountains. But this was no different than and then uh, uh, primitive groups anywhere that are, that are anti-modernist. They, they did not want modernism of any stripe brought to Afghanistan. But they certainly were not the, the, uh, the progressive movement that was actually active in the country at the time. Elizabeth Gould, I want to come back to this country and how the narrative about what happened in Afghanistan was talked about and created in this country. Um, Dan Rather, you write extensively about Dan Rather in your book, former news anchor for CBS Evening News and now managing editor and anchor of Dan Rather Reports on HDNet. He was on MSNBC's Rachel Maddow show last month discussing Afghanistan. The ancient Greeks, the British, and the Soviets tried to do a version of what we're doing, but I do feel obliged to say, it because it's true, uh, that they all tried to colonize Afghanistan. We are not seeking to colonize Afghanistan. The Soviets made no bones about it. They were coming in to take over the country. They wanted to run the country, wanted to be there 100,000 years from now. That is not the case of what we're trying to do. Elizabeth Gould, your response. First of all, uh, it, we have to go back and really look at Dan Rather's contribution to the way in which the story was framed originally back in the early 1980s. After the Soviets crossed the border, Dan Rather was really the first person, the first journalist, who really established the idea that this war should be viewed through superpower confrontation um, between, the, you know, basically the evil empire and the freedom fighters. And this was actually documented by Jay Petersell, who wrote an article in the Columbia 
Columbia Journalism Review that was uh, out in the, I think it was in the spring of 1981, which actually analyzed the way the reporting was happening um, in our country about Afghanistan and how it suddenly changed after Dan Rather had this report on 60 Minutes. This is when he had gone into the mountains in Afghanistan through Pakistan, and he had gone in uh, to basically talk with the Mujahideen. And Peter Zell's comments in his review uh, highlighted the fact that it was a very um, he was very skeptical of how serious Rather was at really probing into the deeper implications of where the financing was coming from, and the fact that the time was the financing was coming from the United States, but suddenly the reporting changed after Dan Rather's report. So he became the sort of the the the, the tone of the storytelling, and we did our first story for CBS News, and we experienced that that tone. Um, it was very interesting to see the way they looked at the material, where we brought back a story that indicated there was a more complex story, that there was an Afghan uh, civil war going on, that there was an issue that had to focus on the Afghan part of it. There was no interest. The only interest they had was in focusing on uh, the amount of uh, Russians in the street and, and, and the American viewpoint that this was a holy war against the evil empire.